Well, I think what has happened in physics over the past or hundred years, really, we are entering a kind of reductio ad absurdum. Instead of getting closer to a solution, we seem to be getting further away and fundamental questions loom up to which no one seems to have the answer. So it is a very strange period in the history of physics, and in a sense, it is self-defeating. It Questions arise which physicists can't answer, and so we are, I see it, reaching the end of an era, a 400-year arc of history which began with Galileo and Newton, seems now to be approaching it. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes, and as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers, because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button, and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running, and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems, because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Wolfgang Smith. He's a scholar and researcher in the fields of mathematics and physics, but also a writer on theology, metaphysics, and religion. He's coming out with a movie, it looks like January 10th, uh, The End of Quantum Reality, which we'll talk about a bit, and I want to talk to Wolfgang about many subjects. So, Wolfgang, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Just fine, thank you. Glad to be on the program. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about your background and what you've been studying over the long years. started quite early, post-14, when I became very interested in the question of physics and, of course, very naive about it, but the idea that physics can explain all that happens in the universe, the fundamental science that fascinated me, so that was the start of it all. So I entered Cornell University when I was 15, and I majored in physics, mathematics, and philosophy. And by the time I graduated at 18, I had found that I couldn't agree with everything that I was being taught. So really, it, it all started way back in those early days. Well, now that it's going to be uh, 2020, hasn't uh, physics and science solved everything? They know the universe now, uh, even after all this time. What do you see literally as of today? How close are we as scientists and physicists and you know, also humans thinking about the metaphysical realm? Are we anywhere close to figuring out the nature of reality? Well, I think what has happened in physics over the past or hundred years, really, is that we are entering a kind of reductio ad absurdum. Instead of getting closer to a solution, we seem to be getting further away, and fundamental questions loom up to which no one seems to have the answer. So it is a very strange period in the history of physics, and in a sense, it is uh, it is self-defeating. It, questions arise which physicists can't answer, and so we are, I see it, reaching the end of an era, a 400-year arc of history which began with Galileo and Newton seems now to be approaching. And so what is, um, I guess what I'm seeing in general and I'm just one person, but I, I speak to a lot of scientists, clinicians. I'm seeing a, a division where religion and metaphysics are ridiculed, and people seem to be, a lot of people seem to be at least on the surface, comfortable with the idea that the universe came from nothing spontaneously, and random events uh, 
and this mysterious thing called evolution drive everything. That's what I'm seeing. What, what have you seen over time, and what are you seeing now? Well, I'm seeing that, first of all, uh, let's talk about physics, because it's the fundamental science. And what I see in physics are really two things, and they're quite different. There is the bona fide physics, and this is something known only to the physicists. So you do the equations, and you do, you do the experiments, and you know how to predict and then how to measure and test these predictions. And uh, this is a marvelous thing. And in fact, uh, it is something that has uh, led to profound discoveries beginning of the 20th century. And uh, it's a discovery of the quantum realm. It's a discovery that our Newtonian ideas were actually superficial and only approximate. So this, this is one thing. But at the same time, there has always, from the start, been an underlying philosophy. Uh, actually, to be precise, it's the Cartesian the philosophy of René Descartes, really, that has sort of entered into the bloodstream of physicists. They are generally unaware of the fact they have this philosophical predisposition. But that's part of what we by physics. So physics consists, therefore, of two things. There's the technical thing, the authentic physics, and there's the rest of it, the worldview. And this is what I call scientism, because it is something that pretends to be science and based upon science, but it is not science, nor is it uh, validated science. And this is what the general public, of course, uh, takes to be physics, the findings of physics, uh, they, they they don't do the mathematics and the experiment. They it's all scientism the in the broad public outlook. And uh, what is uh, what is scientism then? What kind of definition? How would you define it? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, we all uh, uh, believe in our normal hours, at least in the tense perceived world. We believe the grass is green, for example. Well. Uh, the uh, physicist, in his scientific his scientific hat, denies that. He says that the real the real world is quantum stuff, and uh, qualitative attributes such as color are subjective or imaginary. They're in the neurons or in the mind or however you want to think of it, but they most assur- most assuredly are not in the objective real world because that's the world that he studies and describes with his differential equation, measures with his empirical apparatus. So uh, this is a, a prime example of what I call a scientific belief, this belief that we do not actually perceive the world, that, for example, color uh, is a, what Galileo, uh, by the way, Galileo is the one who this back in the 17th, early 17th century, and uh, this is really the beginning of the this new phase, so-called Enlightenment, Weltanschauung, which through Isaac Newton gained almost complete control of our Western civilization. So uh, the the idea that the grass is not green and that physics has proved it that is a prime example of a scientific belief, by which I mean. It is supposedly based upon science. It is supposedly tested. That is actually false. It is. It cannot be based upon empirical observations at all. And it ha- It is not. It has not been. And in fact, there are strong arguments, even empirical basis, for saying that this subjectivist theory of sense perception is actually false. So here's an example. And. Uh, it always is an important example because it enables us to recognize that if we um, were to take uh, the findings of physics seriously, I mean, scientific claim seriously, we would then deny what we in, in daily life firmly believe. So as I pointed out in my writings more than one, the scientific worldview we've been subjective for close to 400 years has really made us schizophrenic in the sense that we, in our moments of uh, enlightenment, we deny what all the rest of that time we firmly believe. So uh, my writings have been 
very much devoted to this enterprise of sharply distinguishing between authentic science scientific findings, the findings, for example, that power our amazing technology from jet airplanes to cell phones. This is all based upon the first component of physics, the, the authentic science as distinguished from the rest of it, the scientist belief, which uh, is what the public knows about, about physics. They don't know the Schrodinger wave equation and the rest of it. So, what the public imbibes from this scientific culture and we find ourselves is really quite illusory and I don't think it beneficial at all in effect our civilization. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. So what would be a more beneficial interpretation? Well, I'm among those who believe that wisdom and enlightenment didn't just begin in the 17th century, that there are thousands of years of human history where there have been great men, philosophers, prophets, men of high attainment, and that we absolutely, it is absolutely needful for us to pay heed to what they have to say and to learn from them and to get rid of the contemporary notion that everybody in the world was somehow primitive and unlearned, basically ignorant, until Sir Isaac Newton came along to bring light into the world. This is more or less what we learn in our universities today. And I say it is not only false, absolutely unfounded, but also I think it is very harmful in its effect upon human development on our civilization. We need some of the wisdom that uh, bygone ages have to, have to pass on to. So, uh, so any, um, well, maybe it's silly to ask, but what, any concrete examples, any specific beliefs that you see are detrimental to uh, you know, society or people just in their daily lives? Any examples that really strike you? Well, I think... But at the core of it, there is the atheism that uh, most people take away from so-called science. Uh, I'm very disturbed by the fact that our universities have been literally taken over by uh, people who have completely succumbed to the scientific outlook so that the poor young people who go to the university to learn something and to gain wisdom of various kinds are actually uh, subjected to a kind of brainwashing. So I actually, my own belief is this, that to the extent that anyone actually believes what the scientific worldview proclaims as having established is ipso facto um, insane. It is an insanity. The, the, the corollary here is that fortunately uh, nobody believes it uh, all the time. This is what I meant to illustrate with this idea of question of the grass is green. In our normal daily life, the grass is green. And when we sit down and contemplate the world from a scientific point of view, then it, then it isn't anymore. Then green is a kind of subjective, whatever it may turn out to be, but it is definitely not in the grass. It is definitely not a part of the real objective world because, so the story goes, the real objective world is exactly what the physicist describes, differential equations. So, well, they're not able to really describe the world because that's, I guess, one of the strangest things to me, the most befuddling, is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which seems to put a limit on being able to quantify what reality is. It's just a, we, we try to get around it with tricky experiments, but it just seems to be all 
a, a impenetrable roadblock. Well, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is absolutely true with reference to so-called quantum systems. But the important point is, and this is something that uh, has been puzzling physicists uh, for over a century now, the, the amazing thing is that you cannot really assume that the entire objective world uh, is nothing but a quantum system. And incidentally, I am glad you brought this Heisenberg uncertainty principle out because it relates to a problem which has really stymied physicists for, as I say, roughly a century, called the measuring problem. Now, here's what happens. You measure a quantum, and at the very instant of measurement, the differential equation that describes the quantum system is interrupted. There's a discontinuity, and uh, with, say, an electron, as described by the wave equation, wave function, multilocate, the instant you measure it, it no longer multilocates, it is at a precise place. And so with other quantities pertaining to the quantum realm. The moment you measure them, something a discontinuity occurs, and um, the equations that normally describe quantum uh, quantum systems are interrupted. And the point is, no physicist has been able to explain that, to understand that. And so all kinds of, uh, for the most part, very wild conjectures have been proposed by physicists in order to explain what happened this measuring operation. And uh, I won't go into some of these. I mean, to show how deep the question lies, some people have tried to approach this by assuming that at the moment you measure a quantum system, the world splits into as many as many uh, other worlds as there are possible solutions, possible measurements. Uh, this is, of course, wild, and you might even say insane, but it, it illustrates how difficult this measuring problem is from a standpoint of physics. Now, this is really something that I got into many years ago. I happened to come across a book by a physicist named Nick Herbert entitled Quantum Reality. It's a book he published in five, and in this book, Nick Herbert says, Best kept secret is that science has lost grip, physics has lost its grip on reality. So this interested me very much, and so I, this is what got me into um, the philosophy of physics. I, I realized enormous fundamental problems concerning the nature of physics, how it relates to reality, and so I began to investigate and as a result of investigation, I wrote a book, K5, called The Quantum Enigma. And the very first chapter is entitled Rediscovering the Corporeal World. And what I tried to do with limited success in this chapter one is quite simply to argue and to convince reader that the, w the world we perceive is actually real. Uh, the grass is green, the apple is red, you can ha hold it in your hand, you know it's through our five cents. And so... But when is this, like, it, I'm sure you've tried to take your own stab at understanding, let's say, quantum physics. What have you come up with? And, you know, I'm just curious. Uh, this is what I'm trying to lead up to. I have not discovered any few physical laws. I have not done the work of a physicist, but in this book, called The Quantum Enigma, I have done this. I have given a solution to this so-called measuring problem, which, so far as I know, is the only solution standing today. So I, and as I said, the first chapter of this book, called the Rediscovering the Corporeal World, uh, was a matter of uh, showing that the world that we perceive through our five senses is real. It, it's not in my head, it's, it's outside. <laughs> so, based upon this first chapter, uh, all the rest of the book uh, followed rather logically, because if what I claim to prove is right, we're left really with two different worlds, the corporeal world 
and the world of the physicist, which I call the physical world. So, and this, and they're quite different. I mean, in in, in one world the grass is green, and the other it's all quantum stuff. And so the basic problem then was, how do these two worlds fit together? Well, what I did, and I must say quite rigorously in this book, The Quantum Enigma, is this. I proved that you can do all of physics uh, based upon its modus operandi, the way physics operate, by distinguishing two ontological planes, the corporeal world, which we perceive live and be, and the physical world, the world as described by the equations of physics. And these are two ontologically different domains. And incidentally, this connects very close, closely with the ideas of Heisen, whom I regard to be the greatest physicist, the metaphysical understanding involved, because Heisenberg made a very fascinating observation. He said that it comes to quantum particles. We are dealing with something that is midway between and non, and he says that these particle thoughts are reminiscent of what Aristotle called potent potencies as compared actual beings are uh, said to in act. So, uh, in a sense, what I'm doing is just following a long line which were initiated by Heisenberg. So, I arrive at this idea of the two worlds, the corporeal world and beneath it, the physical world, which is a, a realm not of actual, but of potent potent. And so what I show with, I think, complete rigor, is the fact that you can do all the whole business of physics uh, on this conceptual basis, which means also that there's no scientific way of disproving this, um, this claim of mine, this dichotomy between corporeal and physical, because, uh, as I said, uh, according to the modus operandi of physics itself, all of physics and whatever it may uh, lead to empirically can be interpreted on that basis. Quick question, is, it, is all life part of the corporeal world or just humans? Or Well, let me get to that in a moment. What I wanted to say to complete this particular arc, uh, sort of a summary of what I do in the book for quantum is this, that Based upon this distinction of the co between the corporeal and the physical, based upon that distinction, you can you, you arrive at an automatic solution of the measuring. Because what happens in the act of measurement is quite simply a transition from the corpor from the physical, the quantum world, into the corporeal. Because a measuring instrument has to be corporeal failing which it would be imperceptible and therefore wouldn't measure anything. So uh, this resolves the measuring problem in the sense that the discontinuity, the so-called collapse of the state vector, as the physicists call it, can now be understood in ontological terms. And now to, to, to get to your the question you just raised, um, all that we normally actually conceive as well belongs to the corporeal world. This is the world in which we really find ourselves. What the physicist has done is discover the new realm, ontologically speaking, below, beneath the corporeal, a realm of potentia, which incidentally the ancient uh, metaphysicians knew that this such a world exists. I don't think they had a, the remotest idea that you uh, found an exact science uh, dealing with structures in that uh, world of potentia and that this would lead to an incredible uh, technology. That, of course, it did not know, but the, ex the existence of a subcorporeal realm is something that has been very well known by, by the great... Um, I, well, I hope this is not a offensive question, but you know, I know you're, you're older. Um, were you, did you ever correspond directly with uh, Werner Heisenberg or... I mean, are you even are you even old enough to have uh, corresponded with Einstein? Adam, maybe you forgive me if that's a stupid question, but it would be really cool I, if you did with either of them. <laughs> no, I did not uh, correspond with Heisenberg. I, I'm certainly old enough that it would have been possible. I met Albert Einstein when I was 11 years old, but that's another story. <laughs> it was well, that's really cool. I, 
Actually, if well, you don't mind, it's just a short diversion. Would you would you mind telling that story? That's really cool. Well, I had just my family had just arrived from Europe. We were in New York City. It was the uh, summer of 1941. I was uh, uh, 11 years old at the time, and uh, uh, our friends, all of whom were from the old country, you see, we just arrived. They said, "Well, New York is very hot. You better go." somewhere else. So we vacationed in Lake Placid, New York. <clears throat> and the hotel we stayed in was full of people speaking German and other European languages. And so the owner of the hotel knew that Albert Einstein, who also wanted to get away from Princeton, New Jersey, he was also in Lake Placid. So he invited Professor Einstein to come and talk to us in German. And I remember it well. I was very impressed, especially because I had asked my mother not so long before that, uh, who is the most intelligent man in the world? And of course, she said, Albert Einstein. So I was very, very excited when I was 11 years old to be looking at the most intelligent man in the world. That's really cool. Did you talk to him? I thought came down. Yeah. Oh, you listened to him lecture, but did you actually get to meet him and talk to him at all? Oh, no, no, no. It was just, I, to be honest with you, I don't even remember exactly what he said. He was speaking to us for about half an hour in German, and I was fascinated, and I can still see, see him there, but if you ask me what did he say, I, I draw a blank. Okay. Nothing okay. that had made any impression. So back, back to your, uh, thanks for sharing the story, by the way, but um, back to your dichotomy. So you know, if we accept what you're saying, that there are the two worlds, the corporeal and the physical, how does that change science, for instance? How would that inform better science going forward? Well, it changes science drastically. In the first place, let me just mention a technical thing. Uh, I've said that the act of measurement is a transition from between two different ontological planes. Now, in as much as such a transition can only be instantaneous, Therefore, the causation that affects this transition cannot be the kind of causation that we deal with in physics. In physics, we deal with causation that is propagated through space. I call it uh, horizontal causation. And the causation that actually gives rise to an act of measurement does, does not propagate through space. It is instantaneous, and I call this vertical, vertical. So the first thing that comes out of this resolution of the measuring problem is the discovery of a another kind of causation, vertical causation, which does not take place in time. Now, once this idea has, has been formulated, you can then recognize that vertical causation does enter into physics itself in a number of ways. I won't go into it because it is technical, but... Physicists have long known a phenomenon termed non-locality, and this is something that cannot be explained on the basis of horizontal causation. Einstein was very disturbed about. Well, here you have another instance besides the act of measurement where vertical causality enters the picture decisively. Uh, now, in 1998, a mathematician by the name of William Dembski proved a remarkable theorem. He proved that uh, what he called complex specified information uh, is something that cannot be produced by natural cause. An example, uh, if I write a book uh, and I don't copy it, it's original, then I am producing complex specified information. And uh, according to Dembski's theorem, natural causes, or what I call horizontal causes, cannot produce complex specified information. So it happens that all of us, all human beings at least, uh, make avail ourselves of vertical causation in our so-called free acts, our acts which are not in fact determined as some mechanical, uh, semi-mechanical, I mean, a molecular level quantum mechanical basis. Well, uh, this this uh, very interesting, I mean, it, it actually relate, begins to relate to the religious fear because, as you know, I think every bona fide religion in the world uh, insists that 
human is endowed with something called free will. If that were not the case, the whole idea of sin or good and evil would really collapse. So we have free will, and uh, this is something that can now be understood on the basis of uh, vertical causation. Uh, vertical causation uh, is active uh, universally. I mean, throughout the universe, you find vertical causation at, at work. And this is something that, from the uh, physicalist point of view, uh, was denied. In other words, the physicist believes that physical causation is, is all there is. It explains everything, and whatever cannot be explained in terms of physical causation um, is superstitious, is a fault. Well, that has now been disproved. Vertical causation is live and well, and incidentally, I am personally persuaded that it plays an absolutely foundational role in all biological phenomena. In my last book, I referred to physics, the science of the inorganic. In other words, as soon as you get into the organic, uh, vertical causation plays a central role, and uh, which means that uh, physics is unable to explain the phenomenon of life. So biology will come into its own uh, once it begins to uh, recognize act of vertical causation and understands the difference between vertical and horizontal causality. Well, so uh, I guess a, a question coming in from the side here is, um, is it possible for people to create AI that will be, uh, you know, have the capabilities of a living being? Or do you think that because, you know, AI uh, is not corporeal or it can't cause this vertical causation? What's your thoughts? I'm very glad you raised that question uh, because it's important. Uh, AI is something very illusory. First of all, it's misnamed. It's not artificial intelligence. It's artificial something else. You might call it reason uh, or... Uh, the kind of a robotic intelligence and the idea that it is that you can build a mechanism of any kind which is capable of intelligent act is entirely false. This is utterly impossible. Uh, so the acts that the robots can do and do very well uh, are acts of horizontal causation. They are not acts of vertical causation, which is uh, really where intelligent begins to end. So the AI, uh, the AI uh, propaganda, I would say, is very misleading and very, very um, harmful, really, to humankind because it, um, it is suggestive of the idea that we are all complicated machines. Well, we are not. We are not machines at all. We are something entirely different. It is true that every living organism uh, has within its corporeal nature, a, uh, all kinds of uh, molecular mechanisms. These have been, of course, discovered now, the DNA and so on. And this is all very fascinating. But the point is, uh, the DNA alone does not give you life. And uh, incidentally, I was talking with a uh, one of the finest uh, biologists uh, quite recently, and he told me that if you look at the... Uh, the fertilized egg of a fruit fly, let us say, uh, when it begins to uh, divide and form a living organism, in 24 hours, the complex specified information this organism multiplies by some enormous factor. In other words, the uh, passage from a fertilized egg to a, a living organism consisting of billions of cells is something that cannot be reduced, cannot be explained in terms of horizontal. Vertical causality does have a process, and I think this will become known and proved in the biological world probably in a very short period of time. Within a decade or two, I think the, 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 the leading biologists are just on the verge now of recognizing its basic. So the idea that uh, living organisms are basically machines, so they may be molecular machines. Uh, this, although still believed in major quarters, the days of that belief are numbered. What do you, 
Where do you think is the origin of life then? Well, the origin of everything is in God. There's no question about that. And every civilization, uh, every religion from the lowest to the highest uh, has, has recognized. Uh, and uh, I, I think we are reaching a point now where this basic recognition will again be discovered, so to speak, and it will it will become the leading paradigm of human life once again. Uh, as I have mentioned before, I believe that the 400-year arc of history began with Galileo and Descartes is now reaching its end. And so this will be a rediscovery of the vertical dimension, which is the based upon God the Creator. I mean, the distinction between God and the universe defines, as it were, a vertical axis, the axis leaving, leading up the Creator, up the God. And uh, this discovery of the vertical dimension is what uh, is now drawing very near. A, a number of discoveries have been made which point in that direction. A number of people have expressed these ideas very, very clearly. And I think it is just a, a matter of time uh, before this uh, scientific Goliath will actually uh, uh, disintegrate. He's still very powerful, and in fact, you know, there's a tremendous ideolo ideological pressure driving our our sciences. Um, you you. Any, anyone who thinks that there's freedom of the scientific world is sadly mistaken. Uh, the whole project is ideology-driven. It is a kind of religion. I, I like to think of it as an anti-religion. It is a religion from below, and it is very aggressive, and it is very intolerant. There's no freedom of speech. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I could tell you a lot of stories, but I won't because uh, we have better things to talk about, but uh, science is not what it is supposed to free a rational inquiry in the nature of things. Uh, it, there is an ideology behind it, and in fact, uh, in the last century, this ideological factor and the pressures resulting from it have increased enormously, to the point where actual mendacity has occurred. In other words, uh, there are results being uh, falsifications that are being suppressed. All sorts of things are happening in the uh, physical sciences, uh, which really shouldn't surprise anyone. Billions of dollars are involved, and um, the upper echelon of the scientific uh, the scientific leadership, has enormous social standing. I mean, they are the accepted gurus uh, of our society. And so it should not surprise anyone to, when I claim that actual mendacity has entered the picture here and there, and there. anything but a free, free society where everyone is able to express his views, uh, it's a kind of dictator. And, uh, but yeah, science has become, uh, well, it's it's, it's a political weapon and it's become politicized. And you're right, things have been not told or told in certain ways that may not be what they really are. And yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, you, you mentioned the word I was groping for, politicized. That's exactly the right word. It has been politicized and it is no longer uh, possible to assume that every journal article uh, has been properly vetted, that negative results have been reported, consequences drawn, etc. Uh, and this is only going to get worse because, as I say, I, I see the physical sciences, um, in a sense, reaching a crisis day. Uh, now, in the case of particle physics, particle physics, which is the fun foundational physics, what has happened is that in, in the last 50 years or more, the top-ranking physicists have been uh, trying to um, put together, so to speak, the ultimate theory of physics, where all particles, everything, all the everything making up quantum stuff has been duly discovered and put together in a wonderful, grand, unified theory of everything. And the result has been one 
failure after another. Uh, incidentally, a, a very fine German physicist by the name of Sabine Hossenfelder has written a fantastic book called Lost in Math, where she is, so to speak, the whistleblower, if you will, documenting the failures one after another. Let me just give you one example. For a long time, something called superstring theory was regarded as the, the non plus ultra, the theory which will give us all the particles uh, that make up uh, reality. And uh, these particles were characterized by a property known as supersymmetry. And so uh, the, this large hadron collider near Geneva was built uh, in large measure in order to detect the supersymmetry particles. So there you have a tunnel going on the parts of Geneva, uh, 16 miles, I believe, in circumference. I don't know how many billions of dollars it costs. And uh, the fact of the matter is that all the supersymmetry particles that were supposed to be detected, not one of them turns out to be there. So it, it has been a one of the great fiascos of physics, and uh, most so-called string theorists are uh, now drifting into other into other spheres. Right. Uh, these uh, failures obviously are not publicized, but uh, as I said, Sabine Hossenfelder has has uh, written a fantastic book. Uh, I think is the beginning of a recognition on the part of the larger world that physics, fundamental physics, that is, has entered this state of crisis. Uh, well, um, Wolfgang, we're, we're just about out of time. I wanted to, the last thing I wanted to make sure we got in is just very briefly, what what movie is coming out? Tell uh, people the name and where they can find it. The, the film is called The End of Quantum Reality, and uh, we are just booking theaters in various parts of the country where it will come out beginning in January. We have uh, Los Angeles, we have Boston, we have Pittsburgh, we have Cleveland, we have uh, San Diego and a number of other places. And we're still uh, trying to uh, increase the list so that uh, we'll have at least 10 10. Uh, cities in the United States where the film will be shown. I, I guess they call that art theater. Okay, excellent. Well, Wolfgang, um, for people that want to start to take the journey that you've been describing, what uh, should they go to Amazon and get one of your books? So what's your recommendation on how they can go further with this conversation? Well, uh, we have a website, uh, philos-sophia.org, philos P H I L O S hyphen Sophia S O P H I A dot org. So this is on that mm-hmm. website you will find lots of information. Another I write an article there about once a month. And then there's another website on Facebook. They call themselves the Wolf Gangsters. Uh, anyhow, uh, I I can't give you the coordinates. I, I'm not much of an internet expert. But it's an interesting okay. website, and various people post opinions. A lively conversation going on. Well, thank you, we'll say thank you so much for coming here. I really appreciate it. It's a unique opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's great honor. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.